activity will be held using remote participation. It's being broadcast live on PAT, our friends with PAT. And it's also notes are being taken from minutes by our recording secretary, Leanna Harris. Um, you can access the meeting through PAT, uh, or also you can go to a link to broadcast on the Peabody Public Schools District website. It will be located in the red bar on the front page uh, of our website. Uh, once we get to the opportunity for public participation, I'd ask anyone at that time to hit the button to click to raise your hand. And uh, we will, both Chris Lord and I will see that and we'll be able to go to that person uh, to hear your comments. Uh, we have a full committee today. We have our superintendent, uh, Dr. Mark Kerbel, our assistant super, superintendent, Dr. Chris Lord. Uh, very happy to have our, our incoming superintendent, Dr. Josh Vidala with us also. Uh, we have our business manager, manager Joe Scanlon, and human resources director, Steve Farrell, uh, special education director, Carla Chioda, and uh, I think that was it. So why don't we go uh, first start off the meeting with a moment of silence and a couple of members of the committee uh, brought up and um, wanted to dedicate this moment of silence to Kara Murtag. Kara would have turned 45 years old today. Um, I think all of us know um, how we felt about Kara and the special place she holds in the hearts of so many of all of us here in the city. Uh, she would have been 45 years old today. Um, still can't believe it. And uh, But if we could keep her and her family in your thoughts during this moment of silence. So let's take a moment now, please. Okay, thank you. And as best we can, if everybody could please stand uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation one. under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, before we go into the agenda, I did want to speak. Um, I know we had moved the time of the meetings to 3 p.m., and I was in full support of that. And I think the thought was that that might be better to accommodate people, particularly our students that might want to listen in. People were home. We thought having it early uh, might be uh, helpful, and particularly we thought the meetings would run pretty lengthy, which they have been. Um, but now with people going back to work and maybe starting to reopen a bit here, uh, I would like to move forward, uh, move the meetings back to our 7 p.m. regular start time. So all future meetings would start at 7 p.m. The next meeting right now scheduled is June 2nd, uh, 2020. So um, there's no objections. I'd like to move forward and uh, go back to the, uh, the regular time. I think it's appropriate. So um, approval of minutes. Uh, we have a number of regular school committee meeting and special meeting minutes. Um, I'd entertain a motion to take those up now. Mr. Mayor, I move to accept and approve regular school committee meeting minutes of May 5th, 2020. Second. Second. Great. Thank you. We've heard the motion by Mr. Hockman to approve the regular school committee meeting minutes from May 5th, 2020. That motion was seconded by Mrs. Dunn. Roll call vote, please, on those minutes. Mr. Amico? Yes. Mr. Anotis? Yes. Mrs. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Hockman? Yes. Mr. Olympio? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Mayor, right, I move that we you. approve. I move that we approve the minutes from the graduation planning meeting on May 11, 2020. Terrific. Second. Thank you. You've heard the motion by Mr. Hockman for approval of the May 11, 2020 special meeting, seconded by Mr. Arnotis. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Amico. Yes. Mr. Arnotis. Yes. Mrs. Toppenter. Yes. Mr. Hockman. Yes. Mr. Olympio? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? 
Yes. Okay, next meeting is February 11th, 2020, regular school committee meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the February 11th regular school committee meeting minutes. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Do we have a second? Yeah, on them. Those were already approved. Yeah. Second. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, oh. All right, so hold, we have a motion made by Mr. Arnotis, was seconded uh, by Mr. Amico on the motion. Mrs. Dunn? Just a point of information, those were already voted to be approved. Okay. They listed on our agenda. Is there a reason that they were listed on our, on our agenda? I believe because the the meeting of the 25th was when I made an amendment. And I think that that is why they're in here for informational purposes. Okay, so should we, it looks like though the February 25th regular school committee meeting was not approved? Correct. Correct. All right, so I'd entertain a motion to approve those minutes. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Mika, um, uh, Mr. Hockman? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think procedurally we need to have the prior motion withdrawn before we can undertake a new motion. Thank you, you're correct. Uh, I'll withdraw the prior motion. <laughs> thank you. So we would, uh, Mr. Our notice withdrew the February 11, 2020 approval of those regular school committee meeting minutes. And now we'd like to move forward with the February 25th, 2020 regular school committee meeting minutes. I'd entertain a motion. Do I have a motion? Mr. Mayor, can I just get some clarification before I'm able to make a motion? Yes, please. Sorry, and through you to maybe Ms. Dunn uh, or Ms. Carpenter or anyone else. Um, I know that there was an amendment or I believe that there was an amendment at some point to some meeting minutes that Ms. Dunn made that we did not act on. Is that this the, the minutes for this meeting, Ms. Dunn? Yes, at the February 25th meeting, I made a motion to amend the February 11th minutes. Okay, so through the mayor to Ms. Dunn, we've already approved the February 11th minutes as we see them. Mm -hmm. Can you just please re restate the amendment you were seeking to make to those minutes, if you can? Yes, I requested an amendment to page six of the February 25th minutes. I'm sorry. Under the public participation of the 25th to reflect that, to reflect that through the public, Mrs. Michelle Baker provided a document and requested the Freedom of Information Act request and made a Freedom of Information Act request. And again, Mr. Mayor, if I may. I'm sorry, this you? is, you know what? All right, we're gonna, we're gonna hold this item. We're gonna hold this item. I don't know why it's in here. Uh, we're gonna get a legal department to review those minutes. Um, this is a, a um, yeah. Freedom of Information Act request that has to go to the legal department. Um, we're going to move on to the next item. Uh, approval of bills, Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. I'd like to um, approve warrant number 4478, dated May 19th, 2020, in the amount of $301,899.31, subject to audit. Second. Second. Thank you. You've heard the motion by uh, Mrs. Dunn for approval of, excuse me, Mrs. Carpenter for approval of warrant 4478, uh, seconded by Mr. Olympio. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Amico? Yes. Mr. Anotis? Yes. Mrs. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Hockman? Yes. Mr. Olympio? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? Yes. I'd like to make All a right, motion next. to approve warrant number 4479 dated May 
19th, 2020, in the amount of $2,992,689.14, subject to audit. Second. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. You've heard the motion for approval of warrant 4479, seconded by Mr. Olympio. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Amico? Yes. Mr. Anotis? Yes. Mrs. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Olympio? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Carpenter. Uh, we'll go to continued business. Uh, first item, um, the MSBA Higgins project. Mrs. Dunn, anything new to report on that item? Nothing new to report, Mr. Mayor. We're still proceeding through the closeout process. People are wondering why it takes a while, and it's with the MSBA. There are a lot of steps going through the review on that. But we are doing some smaller projects uh, to complete some of the um, anticipated needs at the building. So it, it is still open and still ongoing. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, the fiscal year 2020 budget updates. I uh, wanted to open that up, um, Dr. Kerbel or Mr. Scanlon, any new information on the FY20 budget you wanted to provide? Yeah, I'll talk to that a little bit. Thank you. Then Joe can, can add in. We've been spending uh, quite a bit of time looking at the FY20 budget. And um, we have scrubbed, gone through all of our cost centers. I think the um, um, our business administrator has gone through all the salaries looking at transportation, special education, expenses. Um, we looked at, actually spent a lot of time yesterday looking at um, where we would end up for the FY20. Looks like we will be in the range of, now this is fluid, $450,000 to 500,000. Um, and the reason why I say it's fluid because the day before we thought we were a little bit lower, Day before that, we thought we were that much higher, but I think that um, Joe has rectified all the expenses and we look like we're, we'll be in the black around $450,000. All right, thank you, Dr. Kerbel. Um, Mr. Scanlon, anything you wanted to add? Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Kerbel. I know these are um, moving targets quite a bit, um, I know there's transportation, special education costs, a number of things that uh, can change dramatically from day to day. Uh, but I appreciate the hard work that's been going into this to try to close out this, this uh, fiscal year, this school year. Uh, I think everybody knows we're experiencing uh, quite a bit of uh, trouble with our budgets um, as we're working through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, all of our... Um, state aid that we're uh, expecting or gonna be expecting for the next fiscal year, just because of the uncertainty in terms of our budget and the finances, both on the local level now that's taking place and I think more to come. Um, and hopefully we can get back to some normal operational work, which I think we'll hear about. I know that work hasn't stopped. So um, I think we're just gonna have to do the best. we Working on the request for services for the design uh, the designer, the architect. And at that meeting, the language for the RFS was approved and authorized for publication by that subcommittee. It will be submitted after some questions tomorrow with the MSBA for just some clarification on, on a small piece of language, how we're going to process all the paperwork for this project. We'll get that straight. And then next Thursday, Hopefully at 9 a.m. we'll have a Zoom meeting of the entire Welch School Building Committee to bring everyone up to date on everything that's going on and then to prepare for the next steps. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, let's hold item number four. We'll go to redistricting. I did want to report that we're, we've been putting the redistricting committee together. I was very happy that Ryan Melville from the city council has agreed to join the committee uh, with Mr. Hockman. And there's been a couple of teachers that um, we've spoken to that would like to join as well. So I think it's starting to come together. Um, the only thing I was waiting on was to just make sure that um, Dr. Vidal, as, as he's coming in, uh, would have the opportunity to be a part of that meeting and, and 
is helping with the forming of the agenda and things of that nature. So I know Dr. Vidal is on the call today. Uh, he and I have spoken a bit. Um, and Dr. Vidal, I, I have been moving forward with that committee and putting that together. I think we're going to have a very strong group, but certainly you're going to be an integral part of that. And just want to make sure that you are up to date on things and uh, we should be moving forward pretty quickly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Looking forward to it. Okay. okay. Uh, now I'd like to move to public participation. And I think we have some speakers that would like to be heard today. And let's see. Mr. Mayor, there are two speakers that have raised their hand, Michelle Baker and Mary Henry. Okay. Um, Michelle Baker, why don't we go to you first, please? Can uh, allow her to talk now? Yeah, please bring her in. She should now be part of the program. Her name should appear on the screen to everybody, and she has speaking rights at this time. Um, Michelle, proceed. Okay. I was informed that I only have three minutes today. Um, this is going to take about 30 seconds out of that. You had talked about the amendment a few minutes ago. I just want to point out that's been tabled, ignored, brought up again, ignored, and brought up again today. So that's five meetings that this has been tabled for. Um, I'm not sure why you would bring in council when my daughter actually pointed out on the previous minutes where you all unanimously agreed and um, wasting taxpayer money when you can actually just review the video. Um, it it seems, seems more logical, but... Um, I want to bring up the HR committee report on the investigation of the Higgins Middle School search. Um, and I'm just going to bring up a few talking points through that. Um, you should all have a copy, I'm sure. So the policy of searching lockers was cited as, as making it lawful. Um, if the students were lockers, then you could exercise a search in the interest of safeguarding the children of school property. Uh, the second item is your policy states officials must use their judgment to protect each child's constitutional rights to personal privacy. Students had to be protected from coercion in the interest of all students and the school. They were threatened with police involvement a minimum of three times with a search. And student resource offices are meant to protect the children and to form a uh, foster a positive relationship between students and police and not to be used for um, someone to fear. Um, finally, an effort was supposed to be made to contact a student's parent or guardian, as stated in your policy, but keep in mind, after I stated I wanted to be present for my daughter's search and questioning, um, I was there 15 minutes and they did it without me right before they brought her down. Um, it was not an unbiased search it, because the teacher and students, the student who alleged the money was stolen and the teacher were not searched. Um, it also said the class was coming to an end and it was the last uh, class of the day. Also incorrect. It was not at the end of the class and it was not the last class of the day or the teachers would not have received an email stating not to mark those students tardy. Um, it also states that the students were cooperative. Of course they were. What child would assert his or her rights to four officials that were present? Um, in the mutual of understanding agreement between the Essex County District Attorney's Office and the Peabody Public Schools and Police, Section 3 um, 3C, search and seizures, it states searches may be conducted with reasonable suspicion of carrying or concealing materials prohibited by federal, state, or local law or by the provisions of the discipline code, such as any object that could be used to harm individuals. Finally, what I have continually asked for are three simple things. Acknowledgement to the students from the superintendent that this policy of the school will be reviewed and updated as necessary that they were not individually suspected of a crime and that steps will, will, will be taken place to handle these situations differently in the future. The second thing was an updated policy with no room for interpretation as dictated by current state and federal law. And the third was that staff be informed of what is and what is not a lawful search. So now I have a fourth request. Do not call the policy interrogations and procedures and seizures. Interrogations require a minor to have a guardian present um, whether they're in or out of school. Even though I was told I would have to file a civil suit to see any of these requests fulfilled, I do not see the need to invite a lawsuit by incorrectly titling something. I'm sure my three min minutes are up. And again, if you want to discuss this collectively or individually, please contact me as I've stated several times before. Otherwise, I'll see you at the next school committee meeting. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Baker. You're welcome.
Mr. Thank May, there's you, an uh, additional speaker here, Mary Henry. Yep, uh, hold on, Chris. Um, so I, I just wanted to state that the only reason the attorneys were brought in is because of uh, Mr. Baker uh, appropriately made a Freedom of Information Act request, and that gets turned over to uh, the city attorney, and that's the only reason that was brought up. Um, but um, we will now move on to the next speaker, Mrs. Henry. Hey, Mrs. Henry is now available. Um, it does say mute. Oh, now she's not muted. You may speak, Ms. Mary Ms. Henry, you're on. Good afternoon. I am Mary Henry. As all of you know, I am the president of the Peabody Federation of Teachers, Local 1289, AFT Massachusetts, and AFL-CIO. Um, we are proud of our union status and our members' uh, involvement in the education of our children in this community. As most of you know, we have been having educators from the Peabody Federation of Teacher at every single school committee since September of 2019 and many before that, including our member Karen Mayo, who's gone for 20 years. Um, I just wanted to say that we're very committed to the education of the children of our community and to their families' needs, to meet the needs of the children and family. We've worked very closely together with Dr. Kerbel and the administrators to provide a positive learning environment in an unprecedented circumstance. Um, I've heard that there's been some questioning of the uh, work of some of our members. So I'd like to just point out some of the things that educators have been doing in addition to the normal instruction, which has included uh, providing uh, lesson plans weekly or daily, depending on the uh, individual, uh, Google Meets, uh, sometimes Zoom Meets, um, reaching out by email, reaching out um, through social media, using Google Voice to call families. We've had paraprofessionals volunteer to translate. Our uh, shout out to our special educators who are doing far more than they could ever be possibly expected to do and are living up to those expected expectations. Uh, we have children, in fact, while I was waiting to speak, I got an email from a child who said, I don't know where to begin. And when I get off, I will go and I will talk to him and we will make it work because we care about our children. Um, we have had teachers take packets of work to children's home, go to parades, write notes, and do so many extra things. Um, I, I got some quotes from folks, but I think this one says it the best. This is from a veteran teacher who said, I'd rather be on my feet for 10 hours than on my seat for 10. I'm for, I'd rather be on my feet for seven hours than on my, uh, ah, I said it so badly. Let me try one more time. <laughs> I'd rather be on my feet for seven hours than on my seat for 10 hours. Most of our, us are working 10 hours a day or longer. We are answering emails from children at night. I personally had um, 35 Google Meets last week and we have a lot of teachers who are doing um, really amazing things. We wanna thank the IT department in Peabody who has done an amazing job helping people, coaching people up and learning our job. This is unprecedented and I just wanna say we are here to support the children and we are very proud to be part of that this community. Many of our members have children who attend school here and uh, both of my daughters graduated from PB High School. Uh, we, we bleed Tanner blue. Um, I have offered to be here for these meetings in case you have questions for me. Uh, I know that my role is not as a school committee member. However, I think it would behoove you to have me in a non-participatory participatory place where I could be available for questions as things go along. And I'm offering to you right now to do that for every school committee meeting. I will carve the time out of my busy work day to be there so that I can help you do your jobs more effectively. Uh, that is all I have to say. Thank you so much uh, to all the children and families of Peabody. We really care about you and we want good things. And uh, we will also help uh, Dr. Vidala with creating a plan for the future. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you, Mrs. Henry. Uh, I think I can speak for all of us. We truly appreciate your hard work and every all of our educators' hard work. It's just amazing uh, what, um, what we're all going through right now and 
uh, we've been coming together and I think doing a terrific job. So thank you for that update and look forward to future meetings um, as we work through these issues. So um, I don't see anybody, uh, Dr. Lord, I don't see anybody else with their hand raised. So we will go back to the agenda. No one else has raised their hand, yeah. Okay, um, now we'll go to superintendent's report. And uh, Dr. Kerbel, turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. I want to welcome uh, Dr. Vidala, Josh. Welcome to Four Square or 10 Square or whatever this, uh, it's good to see you. Got a chance to get to know Josh pretty well because he's involved with a lot of meetings now. And more so as we, um, we, we go forward. I'm hoping for a smooth transition. I want Dr. Vidal to do a great job for the city of Peabody. And I'll do my best to make sure that it's a smooth transition. I got a great story for you, I do. And, and a, a mom sent me an email late this afternoon. And you probably already know this, I didn't know this, but McKenny Diamond, who's a six year old um, student who attends a South School, had a social distancing lemonade stand this past weekend. And, uh, and that was to raise money for the Everett Grace uh, Food Pantry. And her grandmother's a director and uh, McKenna raised $500 for the pantry. So she was featured on Channel 25. So hats off to McKenna. Great job, McKenna. We're proud of you for doing something like that. Her mother says she's got a big heart and uh, Huge heart, she said, so I think it's wonderful. I want to talk a little bit about um, summer school. I'm, with, I'm, with, I'm looking at, I want to mention summer school um, because listening to uh, um, the, the governor talk about opening up different phases, seems we have somewhere around nine weeks before we get to a phase four. Okay, and I'm, we might be right on the cusp in terms of running summer school, at least for our special ed and ELL students. So we uh, we had a meeting recently with Carla Tiada and um, Deb Jackson and Seath Badad. I invited Seath here today um, because this is, we, we really, we have to plan for either remote learning for special education and ELL, on support, right? or we're gonna be going into our schools. And I think it looks like it's gonna be more of a remote. And so right now we, we, we've, um, we've, we're in the process of hiring teachers, but we're holding back on hiring any other support personnel until we know that we are going to go into schools. So I wanted you to know that. The other thing is Seath had a really good idea and that is about our seniors who are, graduate, or who are not graduating because they're short credit. As of right now, we'll know their status in two weeks. And so see that a great idea about starting summer school earlier. And since it's, it's um, online credit and credit work, we can get started before July. And knowing that graduation date is now August 1st is an opportunity for students who don't have enough credits to graduate can finish up and get their diploma with uh, their colleagues. So if you have any questions about that, see this here, see there's some other ideas as well. And I just wanna talk a little bit about student belongings. Okay, I'm gonna finish up in a minute. And um, this way, if you have any questions about anything I've said, you can, you can always go back to it. Uh, student belongings, we're in the process now of making arrangements for students to get their things. I think that some of the principals are getting together and to make the have, especially at the elementary level. So as soon as uh, those plans are finished, I'll work with Jim Hafey and the custodians so that parents and families can get their belongings, whether they go in school or not, we're still working on that. And then, um, Finally, I want to talk about the 2021-2022 uh, calendar. And I want to hold off on that until we get to the written communication. There's a written communication from the city clerk regarding the uh, state primary election, which is September 1st, our first day of school. Okay, and so when we get to that point, we, we have to decide whether 
whether we have school or not, which affects the calendar. So I want to hold off on the draft of the calendar until then. So any questions for me regarding anything I've said so far, because section um, in the agenda four, five, and six, Dr. Vidal is going to address those items in the superintendent's report. Great, Th thank you, Dr. Kerbel. Um, Mr. Miko, uh, like to speak? Yes, thank you through the chair, Dr. Kerbel. Uh, first of all, could we take one item at a time? I think we were jumping around there. And um, th the first one on the superintendent's report is the draft for the 2021-22 school calendar. Is that, right. in, by reading that, that is not this year's, but next year's. Is there a reason why that is on that and on the agenda and not this year's? And I know you mentioned there's something in regards to written communication from the um, the, the clerk's office. But um, I, oh, I'd like sorry, to sorry. this year. Right, sorry, no. no, you're right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. But there's a, there's, this is just a draft of, of the following year's calendar. What should be on here was also the 2021 calendar to address at September 1st. Okay, okay, thank you. Through the chair, I'm gonna respectfully ask that we table the 2021-2022 calendar. Um, we don't know what three weeks from now is gonna be. We're gonna get a lot of guidance from the state for next year and the year and, and following the year after that, depending on lost time of learning. So I'd love to table 2021-2022 for uh, later on and, and just discuss uh, this upcoming calendar, which I believe you said is in written communication, if we could, please. Sure thing. Okay, so we will hold, we will hold that item. Um, Thank you. And I did have, I did have some questions for, uh, for Mr. Bedard um, in regards to the summer school program, if I could through the chair. Yes, please. Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Bedard, for being here. And um, thank you for uh, thinking about credit recovery and trying to get our students graduated. I, I think it's a great idea if we, um, if we do it. I, I would caution that I would hope that it's just seniors who are graduating that we are making this exception for, um, for now. And hopefully that, you know, by getting credit recovery in June, they can graduate in, um, in August. The other part of that is I just wanted to know how many students, if you had an idea on how many would be, um, would fall under that category. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, if I could, um, it was not only for seniors, it was also for underclassmen. Um, the rationale for that being um, right now, with guidance from the state in regards to grading, we're trying to be as sympathetic as we can to the students. Um, right now, students that are failing, the consensus I get with talking to my colleagues at the high school, it's simple because engagement. Uh, there are a lot of kids that just aren't engaging in their schoolwork. Um, seeing the governor's announcement yesterday where he's starting to loosen some of these restrictions, he's opening some, uh, some of the beaches. My, my gut feeling is that a lot of these students, because they're not, they have not been doing schoolwork, I don't foresee them coming to a summer school, whether it be in person or remotely in July. Um, my thought was to move this up now to try and get these kids back into the game. This uh, my uh, my recommendation to the superintendent was to begin on Monday, June eighth, and go through July Friday, July third. Um, that's four weeks. Uh, our typical summer school, uh, our in person summer school that I've run over the last nine years, um, it's usually a four week program, uh, four days a week, three hours a day. So it's a total of sixteen days. Um, the advantage of doing this, number one, it's asynchronous, so you can work uh, whenever you want, as many hours as you want, however you want to work. Um, and also, we're giving the kids more days. There are 20 days in which the kids can fit that class in the window. Um, again, I think it's advantageous for the seniors that may have kind of fell behind when this pandemic started and really didn't take this serious and may have fallen behind the eight ball. It's also advantageous for some of the students that, our underclassmen that may have kind of blown this off at the beginning of trying to get back into the game, but may have felt that, you know, maybe it's a little bit too late and have already given up. Um, it's just a carrot to get these kids more engaged. Um, I haven't discussed, discuss, again, I've discussed it with Dr. Kerbel and Dr. Lord. I have not brought it to uh, any of the, the high school leadership team to discuss it, get their opinion. 
but again, it was, it's, it, it's justified. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. Through the chair question. Uh, yeah, thank Mr. you. Uh, had, has asked how many um, seniors are involved in the summer school that would happen that first few weeks of June. Um, there's somewhere between five and 15 seniors. They're, we're still not done with the year, so we don't know exactly how many will be there, but somewhere between five and 15 seniors would be able to take advantage of that opportunity. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lord. Thank you, Mr. Miko. Uh, Mr. Hockman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wasn't expecting to talk about summer school till later on in the agenda, but Dr. Kerbel brought it up, so let's flesh it out now. Um, I asked for summer school, this topic to be put on the agenda for two reasons. One, uh, first of all, welcome, Mr. Bedard. It's always a pleasure to see you, uh, although I prefer it were in person. Um, and uh, and by the way, thank you for um, uh, directing me to Kevin Euclid's Twitter account. Uh, it's very informative. Sorry for the aside, everybody. Uh, but the other reason for summer school that I wanted to talk, or the other item for summer school that I wanted to talk about was um, to Ms. Chioda, um, because we have two summer school issues. One is a credit recovery issue. And I kind of like the idea that Mr. Bedard came up with um, about starting early, particularly for seniors, to let them walk with their uh, classmates um, for a graduation that's currently scheduled for August 1. Um, and uh, my bigger concern at this point is Mrs. Chioda because we have IEPs that require summer school um, for students in our district. So I was hoping to get some sort of update on where that stands and what that looks like. Uh, it's, it's a more, I suspect, a more difficult um, prospect to accomplish remotely, but I, you know better than me. So can you give us some, through the mayor to Ms. Chioda, can you give us some um, insight as to what's going on, what the conversation sounds like and what your thoughts are? So through yeah, the mayor. Uh, yes, please, Mr. Chioda, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so we are planning for both eventualities. We're currently in the process of hiring um, our, our level of staffing. Um, should we remain in remote instruction? We are providing remote instruction currently, so capacities have developed. Um, as we move forward, we'll have to listen carefully to the governor and to the State Department of Special Education Planning and Policy to determine whether or not uh, remote instruction remains in place for the coming school year. We do have applications available to expand our staffing should we go direct um, and live. Um, and we will, of course, work with the Department of Public Health, Health and the um, the custodial department if we are approved to um, hold live sessions to make sure that students are, maintain safety. Thank you, Ms. Chioda. Mr. Mayor, if I may still? Yes, please. Through you to Ms. Chioda, are there opportunities or is there a conversation about using perhaps non-traditional um, locations so that there is the opportunity for social distancing while um, having a summer school, like maybe a gymnasium or even outdoors at a football field or the gym race fields at the middle school or, you know, when the weather's conducive to that. I, I don't know if that's part of the conversation or if that brings brings upon other difficulties. Um, I don't know. I, I suspect they do. Um, so each each has its benefits and its drawbacks. There may be some difficulties to, to going remote on a regular basis um, in an outdoor location. Weather is a factor. Um, certainly, access to materials is a factor. Um, we're really looking to make sure that students have the best quality of instruction that they can receive during the summer program. We have sent out a survey to all of our families um, and are working to hear back from all of our families as to their um, intentions, whether it's provided remotely or in person. Um, and Mrs. Crompton, the lead team chair, has been working very diligently to make sure that we get all of the information that we need moving forward with that. So we really want to make sure that we know who is interested, whether it's remote or direct. Um, we're looking at all of the safety concerns. Um, I've had conversations with the superintendent about the possibility of communicating with DPH as we get closer to looking at what safety protocols would need to be put into place. Thank, thank you to both Ms. Chioda and to Mr. Bedard for your efforts. And I'm, ha I'm happy, as I suspect that these conversations are already taking place. I think it's just important that we um, 
we discuss these conversations publicly uh, to the extent that we can so that um, our constituents, families, uh, staff members, and students certainly have an idea as to what may, you know, what those possibilities are, and perhaps even have an opportunity to contact you folks um, in, in regard to planning for what's going on. I, I did also want to talk about what remote learning looks like, Mr. Mayor. I don't know if I see Ms. Dunn has her hand up. I don't know if she wanted to talk about um, summer school first and or. No, why don't we stay with you, Mr. Hockman? Let's, let's, um, yep. So let's stay with, uh, stay with you. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and through you to Dr. Kerbel, um, can we get an update on what remote remote learning looks like? We've been getting some emails with regard to ELL that um, are making me slightly uncomfortable. Um, we really haven't had, uh, I haven't had much by way of updates as far as what um, remote learning looks like. I hear Mr. Bedard talking and I, I don't know if he's talking about the population within his uh, academy or if it's the population in general, um, that there are kids who are not engaging. Uh, I'm sure that we have quite a few kids who are not engaging. Uh, what are we doing to re-engage them, if anything? Um, do we have percentages or, or do we have an idea of how many kids are not um, accessing the, you know, the efforts of our staff, as Ms. Henry's identified some of them earlier in this meeting? Um, can, can you just give us maybe a broader stroke update as to what, what's going on at the various levels in, in the district? Yeah. Sure. All right. It's a good question, Mr. Hockman. So there are a lot of meetings that happen all the time. One of my major concerns has to do with EL student. I asked um, Deb Jackson, who works with the EL uh, teachers, um, questions about just that. How many, how many students are engaged? How many are not engaged? What percentage of them are engaged? Um, I asked for a short survey in which the EL teachers uh, completed. So it really comes down to this. Those students who have, um, who are comfortable with language uh, are more engaged than those that are not, okay? And what really works is when you have native Spanish and native Portuguese speakers who engage students and just talk and say to them, look, this is what we want you to do. We want you to be involved with schools. When that happens, more kids stay engaged. When there's a follow-up with EL students, that, popu that population will be engaged in classroom, you know, with your classroom teacher during Google Meets, for example. There are some students that don't have connectivity. There are some students who, um, there are some students who take care of their own families while mom and dad are working. We have students who will work on their own. So there's um, a lot going on in families. And so what we're trying to do is um, th actually through the benefit of the our union presidents, reaching out to teachers, clerks, paraprofessionals. If we have native speakers, we're recruiting them to make the phone calls. In fact, and that's, and that's currently happening, which is really great. In terms of remote learning at every level, um, I used to hear complaints all the time when we first started about, about how to connect, how to run these Google Meets, how to engage students, how to set up plans. All of that is happening now. with the difference of day and night between the first three weeks and the last three weeks. My meetings with principals, we have meetings twice a week. Um, and we you know, talk about all the agenda issues. First, first and foremost, always is about equity, okay? And I think our teachers are doing the best they can with, this, with all students. Um, Mary Henry, who's been terrific in terms of trying to work together, has talked about what's happening at the high school, people who reach out, people um, who are trying to connect at all hours of the day. I listened to C talk the other day, Deb Jackson, the EL director, talking about getting up at midnight because kids come home from work and they're online and they're sending text messages about how to do something. And um, these folks are getting up in the middle of the night and responding. So um, I think at the middle school where, you know, Todd would, um, Todd would, uh, Todd Busey, the principal would talk about the one-to-one -one program that they have has made it 
an easier transition for students to do their remote work at home. Um, so uh, I hear positive things about what's happening at the middle school. Uh, let's see. Um, one of the things that I, I suggest you do, if you go to the, our closure website, you see all the learning plans that are there. And then if you look at elementary to the right of all the schools and you can go in and you can take a look at almost every grade level, you can see some of the work that teachers are doing. Um, you might be able to get connected and go on say the center school. I'm connected to the center school and the Welch school. So um, sometimes I go in and take a look at what they're doing on Dojo, which is a platform. And you can see the art teachers, what they're presenting on YouTube, uh, music teacher who's singing, reading a book. I mean, everything is happening. And I think a lot of things are happening is because we have, um, um, not only our teachers have been terrific in terms of stepping up, but our 21st century uh, technology team, our learning team, I call it the dream team, and they have offered 10 weeks of professional development. They've changed their professional development now so that teachers can get um, asynchronous videos and take a look at how to, how to use their technology to help them in classrooms, as well as live conversations with colleagues or get personal coaching from anyone. So our memo has been, we try to help teachers, we try to help students. And I think we've come a long way, uh, Jared, and. Uh, in this whole issue of remote learning, because start before we went out, I asked someone, one of the technology folks, I said, would we be ready? This is in March. Would we be ready in the fall to implement remote learning? And he said, I don't think we have a shot at that. And then two days later, we closed school down for up until now. So our teachers have been stepping up and doing terrific. And I wanna really thank, Jared, I really wanna thank the clerks and uh, paraprofessionals and long-term substitutes. These are native speakers in Portuguese and Spanish who have called students and, um, uh, and tried to get them engaged. So in terms of a percent, you're talking about percent, there are some percentages. Okay, I don't have that top of my head. Uh, um, you know, we just let's say, let's just talk about regularly, typically developing students who are engaged um, all week long. I can't give you a percentage. I want to say, you know, seventy percent would be really. I'd be saying, hey, seventy percent would be terrific, but I, I can't give you exact exact numbers. Yeah, doc, that's fine. So that, that, the answer. Was Sorry. that that was an unfair request of me. I didn't mean literally for you to give me a percentage, but th but thank you for your response. I mean, again. It's important for people to hear the things that are taking place around the district. It's important for people to understand where they can go uh, on a website to, to look at all the things going out going on in the district. Because not everybody's aware of it. Just because it's happening doesn't mean that the the, the, the people out there, whether it be students or families or grandparents who are now taking care of kids as people go back to work, or aunts or uncles or neighbors, they're not all aware of it. So let's just make sure. You know, we, we or let's continue to tell people where they can find information and, and where they can continue to um, locate avenues to either remain engaged, re-engaged in, in their education. Yeah, I do mention two things um, and then I'll, I'll you know, allow other members to ask questions. Two things. One, I try to send memos every every Sunday to families and I don't want it to be overwhelming. I just try to short spurts of information. And um, the other thing is I want to thank our principals who are always connecting with families and trying to engage families and students. So um, I would say without a doubt, people are working harder now, okay, than ever. And um, I just want to thank them for their effort. Great, thank you, Dr. Kerbel. Uh, appreciate that update. Uh, those were great questions, Mr. Hockman, thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm in a pretty unique situation uh, being the father of four kids, I have one right now who at the high school, one at the middle school, and one in the elementary school. And um, it's great to see them uh, doing their work with their teachers. Uh, they've been very active every day uh, doing work at the house. And uh, so I've been able to see the hard work of the teachers um, 
pretty much every day up close. So uh, there is a lot going on, but I think we can always do a better effort of getting that information out. And uh, that's why it's important. And I think, Mr. Hockman, you put a number of things on the agenda today that are, are very important to get the information out and fill people in as to what's taking place. So wanted to thank you for that. Um, Mrs. Dunn, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had raised my hand to speak on the issue of the summer school. I, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, actually, thank you to Mr. Bedard, especially, because I do think that that idea of uh, capturing those students sooner rather than later is really going to be very important. Uh, they've all been through a rough year and being able to have those seniors do the credit recovery now and hopefully graduate with their classmates is going to make a world of difference in their life. I know that we often have students who um, end up going to credit recovery after graduation and then they are finally able to be awarded their diploma. But I think the difference this year uh, that this could make would be that they would actually be able to participate in the graduation with their classmates. And I think that means a lot to people, especially to their families. So thank you for, for proposing that. And um, thank you to everyone who's trying to make that possible. And then I also would like to just quickly speak on the remote learning presentation you just did, Dr. Kerbel. Thank you. This is very good information. I'm very happy to hear about all the things that are going on. And uh, it is really a credit to the staff and, and to everyone involved with the teaching process of how quickly they have had to change their entire method of delivering education to our children. It is not easy. It's very difficult for the teachers. It's difficult for the families, the whole world. Of course, we know the whole world has changed and um, we've all had to adapt to that. It's nothing that happens overnight, but I think with the amount of work that has gone into this in the preparation that's now being done for the future, that uh, you all deserve a real, a real true thank you. Having the technology department providing that professional development for our staff is huge right now. You, you talk about, you know, learning, learning while you're doing, this is probably one of the most intense learning experiences anyone could ever have as they're taking that professional development, they're putting it into action. And uh, it is a game changer for them as well as for our students. I think that now we will be ready for September with whatever comes our way. And I do think that we should be keeping track of everything as we go along so that we have some written guidance for ourselves on how to proceed, you know, plan A versus plan B, uh, what worked and what didn't, and keep track of this because that, uh, that historical narrative is going to be important going forward because it's, it's all lessons learned. They're very important lessons and we do need to keep them keep them in, in mind when we do have other situations come up. I, you know, you would never think we'd have a pandemic, but there are a lot of other things that can happen that you never anticipate. And there are lessons we're going through right now that can help us with a lot of different things in the future. So uh, thank you. Thank you for discussing it and for bringing it up. And I, I do agree um, with Mr. Hockman. I think this is something that we need to keep up in, in the forefront of our discussions, just to be able to be aware of everything that's going on with this new reality. Don't know what else to call it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Mr. Olympio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through the chair to Dr. Kerbel, uh, how, how many hours a week would you say that the students have one-on-one uh, -on -one face time with their teachers at the elementary, middle school, and high school level? Because I've had some parents uh, reach out to me that they're concerned about the actual face time with their teachers. So um, when you say one-to-one, -one, is it individually one-to-to-one -one, or is it a classroom to teacher? A, a, cl a classroom. Classroom to teacher? Um, I, I mean, is, is there a, 
I would say it is, I, I would be concerned if, if students were not seeing their teachers once or twice a week. If they're not seeing their teachers at all, um, are they connecting in other ways? I mean, some, you know, some, uh, some teachers you some teachers make phone calls, they send texts, they send emails. So they may not be part of Google once a week. Okay, but those that are using Google Meets or Doge, uh, some other type of platform, you like to think it would be a minimum of once a week. Um, with, okay. with assign with other assignments uh, due during the week. So one of the things that we've been uh, talking about. Collectively with the with uh, with our teachers union, would be uh, what are the expectations of students? So we know at the high school, oh, if we think that um, there's uniformity across all classrooms across all schools, we'd be fooling ourselves. We didn't have that. We were all in classrooms when we had school, and that's what some of these we tried to do. But based on uh, people's expertise and comfortability. Um, I would say there's probably some variable variance between classes and between grades, but I think there's certain expectations that we try to put in our MOU, at least contact at least once or twice a week with students as a minimum, okay, and, and I would say teachers are doing a lot more than that. Uh, you know, it's so funny, everybody's sending me text messages, John, you yeah. know, so... I'm with the middle school teachers on average do about one or two a week. The state advised not to do it every day. So that's something that I got. One of the things I want to go back and mention earlier is that a lot of the administrators at the middle school reach out to students who are not engaged with their, with their classrooms. Because I, I think, um, again, a handful of, more than a handful of parents, they've reached out and, you know, and certainly, some parents, for whatever, you know, for various reasons, aren't as engaged in the education process as others. And if they don't see their students with in a classroom setting with their teachers on the Chromebook, I mean, they're just confused with why isn't that happening more frequently than just a, a day or two. And uh, I just, I think that would help you know, maybe explain that a little bit, uh, maybe not so much now, but maybe going forward, because um, if this is what it's going to be like in the fall, I know that's a big concern a lot of parents have. Yeah. I, I, John, I, I think that's a, I think it's a great question to ask. And the principals are, are watching, okay? I know they're watching, I've asked them all to watch, okay? And, um, we meet tomorrow, so this is on the agenda. We, right? I, I, I talked before about equity, okay, and yeah. and, it, and equity is an issue in Peabody. And so yeah. um, I'll be sure to put it on the agenda for next time. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kerbal. Great. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kerbal. Thank you, Mr. Olympio. And uh, I'll turn it over now to Mr. Amico. Thank you for the chair and, and, and thank you, Mr. Olympio, and thank you, Mr. Kerbel. You know, I, I do think we have to realize that this is still new for a lot of teachers. This is still new for a lot of parents, a lot of principals. Um, teachers have been asked to do a lot under these conditions. And I, I think for the most part, most teachers are doing. I, I would say a majority are. And just like any in any profession, any um, job or, or, you know, you're going to, you're going to have some that do a little bit more than others, but I do think having them, having a minimal basis point outlined in an MOU would certainly allow us to know what the minimum point is for teachers to do, and then they can move on from there. And, you know, from the student's end of it, you know, when you have students in front of you, you have a hundred students in a typical day and every student is different. Now imagine having those same hundred students on a remote setting. You know, every, you know, when you walk by a student, you can, you can give, you can make eye contact in a classroom setting. You can tap your finger on a desk and say, hey, you know, pay attention or, 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 you know, read this, or do you have any questions? Now, now envision having those same hundred students 
And the only way to gain that little attention is via email or Zoom meets, you know, or Google meets, excuse me. It's so, it's so much more difficult. So I, I think we're all learning the process. And, I, and, I, and I, I've, I've received a few emails from parents as well. But I would imagine that most parents are sitting back and saying, wow, I can't believe what teachers do all day long. Because it, it certainly is amazing what teachers do. And I, and I think by no means should we be looking at teachers who are um, doing less, if anything. And I, I'll speak for myself. I'm doing as much or probably more than I normally do during a school day. Because those quick, you know, eye contacts or, um, you know, like I said, walking by a student, tapping on the desk to get their attention. Those are a lot easier than having to send an email and then waiting for the email back or, uh, or that type of communication. So I, I, think, I think everyone needs to really be patient with this. You know, edu you know public education isn't perfect, um, nor is anything else out there. Um, so be patient with teachers, be patient with administration. I think we, we have great educators and I think we're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Miko. Mayor, Mayor Benko, can I follow up with that, please? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Amico. It was well said. Okay, I appreciate that, and I and I know that the um, teachers administrators appreciate it as well. So I think that for anyone who has any question, I've always said this: start with the classroom teacher. Call if you have a question, just call the teacher, or send an email to the teacher, or send an email to the principal. Okay, they'll be more than happy to be engaged. In fact, all of the principals have emailed me and said the same thing. Uh, one of the things that is hard to gauge would be, and, and all the principals have mentioned this to me too, would be when during Google Meets, it's tough to see how many students are in the classroom or how many students are engaged the way um, it's set up. All right, but I agree with Mr. Amico. I think people are working harder than ever and that continuously, let's try to work together. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, let's now move on to some additional items uh, under the superintendent's report. And I believe Dr. Vidala, you're gonna be addressing some of these. So I'd like to turn the uh, microphone over to you, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate being here and having the opportunity to speak on the next three agenda items. Uh, thank you to the school committee again for allowing me to be there. So the next uh, agenda on the next agenda item uh, is the update on the principal search. So I wanna begin by just thanking Mr. Steve Farrell for facilitating the search for the PBD Veterans Memorial High School principal. A search committee of various stakeholders interviewed nine highly qualified principal candidates last Thursday, May 14th and Friday, May 15th. The committee was comprised of Mr. Farrell, who also happens to be a high school parent, the teachers union president, Mary Henry, the director of performing arts, John Simons, IEP team chairperson, Shannon Crompton, High School Dean Bill Kroll, School Resource Officer Manny Costa, a student, Jacqueline Scopa, School Committee Person, Mr. Olympio, and Mayor Betancourt. The committee moved forward two excellent candidates, and they indicated that there was one candidate who clearly stood out as their top choice. So on Friday, I shared the recent NEAS report with both candidates and scheduled interviews for Monday, May 18th, with the understanding that the NEAS report would drive the discussion of our interview. After interviewing both candidates yesterday, I was able to confirm the committee's top choice would be the right fit for Peabody. I am extremely pleased to announce the appointment of Mr. Stephen Magno as the next principal of Peabody Veterans Memorial High School, effective July 1st, 2020. Mr. Magno comes to Peabody with a wealth of knowledge and experience in the field of education. He grew up in Peabody, where he attended the Burke Elementary School and the Higgins Middle School. Mr. Magno has 22 years of experience in education, including 10 years as a high school administrator, all of which have been in the Revere Public Schools. He began his career as a special education teacher and spent six years at the high school as a team chairperson. In 2010, Mr. Magno was promoted to the position of assistant principal of Revere High School. He spent the next four years, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the last four years as the principal of our Seacoast Alternative High School. Mr. Magno comes highly recommended as an outstanding leader, a strong communicator, and a collaborative team player. He takes a student-centered approach to education, has extensive experience in special education, and a strong desire to support and empower educators. We're very excited to welcome Mr. Magno to the PBD School Committee, uh, to, to the PBD School Community, 
And you know, I, I'm excited to work with him and to have him join the team. So I'll pause there and, and see if there are any questions from the committee. Well, thank, the, thank you, Dr. Vidala. Um, I, just, I was a member of the committee and I did want to speak to that. Uh, you uh, listed the uh, members of that committee. And I just wanted to say that it was a tremendous group to work with. I wanted to compliment Steve Farrell. He organized the meetings and conducted the interview and uh, did an excellent job. And there were extremely thoughtful questions, pertinent questions all around. Uh, we had great discussions and it was a tremendous group of candidates. Uh, very pleased overall with the quality of the candidates. Uh, all nine presented themselves in a, in a great manner. and. Um, and really there were a number of people that uh, really shown during that process. Um, I think the two that we put forward were, were top notch and uh, we enthusiastically put those two names forward and I'm very excited to have Mr. Magno on board. And uh, I think he's gonna do a terrific job for us. And I wanted to say that. I did wanna say though that the superstar, and I think I can speak for everybody on the committee, uh, the superstar from the committee meeting and, and the questions and the thoughtful responses and was uh, Jacqueline Scopa, who was a sophomore class officer. Uh, she did a tremendous job. I, I can't, I think well, pretty much every, um, after every candidate, Mary Henry asked her uh, to give her opinion because we really wanted to hear from her. And she spoke so eloquently and, and really gave terrific responses. So everybody contributed tremendously. And uh, I really felt good about the work that we did and the recommendations that we could uh, make to you. And I know John Olympio, I'm not sure if he wants to weigh in as well, but he did a terrific job as uh, we all knew he would. And I didn't know, John, if you wanted to maybe speak to your experiences with the committee. Yeah, no, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, it was a tremendous group, uh, real professional. Uh, we certainly had uh, nine great candidates to choose from. And I agree, Ms. Scopa uh, was the star of the committee, uh, but a lot of, uh, a lot of detailed questions. Uh, Mr. Farrell did a great job uh, asking the questions, and I'm really excited about uh, Mr. Magno and the future. And just uh, he, he really impressed me, and so did the others. But I think he's going to be a tremendous fit for the high school, and uh, it was a great, uh, great opportunity to be part of that committee. And thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Olympio. Uh, Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the search committee. I know that's a really big undertaking, um, that position, um, really big shoes to fill. I'm, I would like to congratulate Mr. Magno and I'd like to ask um, the chair if we can invite him to our next school committee meeting so that we can meet him and uh, you know, give everyone an opportunity since there's really no other place for me to see him other than here and um, see if that would be okay and just to say congratulations. Thank you, Mrs. Carpenter. Uh, Mr. Amico. Thank you for the chair. I just wanted to, uh, again, uh, as Ms. Carpenter and Mr. Olympia said, uh, thank everyone for being on that committee. Um, I was on one recently and it's it's not easy. It's a lot of work. It's a, it's, um, it's a lot of detail involved there. And I just wanted to thank everyone for doing that. Um, also, and congratulations to uh, Steve Magno. Um, I've known Steve for about 20 years. Um, I never actually had the uh, privilege of working with Steve, but um, I always heard great things about him. Um, you know, he was no, he's knowledgeable, he's fair, and um, as a PBD kid, he'll do a great job at the high school. So I just wanted to welcome him, and um, I'm looking forward to him being part of the uh, PB family. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amico. Mrs. Dunn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would like to thank all the members of that search committee. I know that is a heavy, heavy load of work to do in order to find the right person. And I appreciate all the work that they did. I'm very happy to hear that you utilized the NEASC report when you were interviewing these um, candidates to make sure that we do have the right fit and that they are going to be able to carry out all of the the good work that has been done at the high school and to be ready for the work that needs to be done to be able to continue to improve. So uh, welcome to Mr. Magno and it'll be, it will be nice to meet him. And uh, thank you, Dr. Vidala. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Mr. Hockman. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and thank you to the uh, search committee and to Dr. Vidala for um, 
your efforts in, in this search as well after the committee presented you with two finalists. Thanks to Mr. Farrell. I'm sure this was a difficult uh, endeavor and I'm sure you handled yourself as professionally as ever. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate, to, as everyone has, to welcome Mr. Magno um, to, to Peabody and to Peabody High School. Uh, there are big shoes to fill up there. Um, just as a kind of a, a, a whimsical point, I'm trying to throw them in when I can during this meeting. I, uh, I had the pleasure of coaching Mr. Magno's cousin when his cousin was 12 years old back in Revere. I think his cousin is now 30. Um, so in any event, it'll be nice uh, to see Mr. Magno at our next meeting. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. Uh, Dr. Vidal, I'll turn it back over to you. I think you have a couple more items. Uh, Mr. I noticed, did you have something? I did, just quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I just want to congratulate Mr. Magno as well. Um, I know this was a big decision and a lot of work went into this. I'm sorry if you can hear my 90 pound lab barking. Um, I'll send his congratulations. I'm gonna make myself, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. I noticed. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mayor. Badala. Uh, so the next item on the superintendent's report is uh, partnership for CTE After Dark with Essex Tech. So I just very briefly wanted to give the committee an update. Uh, this was something that uh, was Tara Murtag's uh, initiation. She started it last year. It gives TV high school students an opportunity to juniors and seniors to engage in CTE opportunities that we don't have at uh, PBD High School and they can go over at 11.30 and engage during their junior and senior year. Last year, we had two students that completed the program. Six began, but two students completed the program as juniors who will be enrolled again. And we have three students who are currently interested. So we're working with Heidi Riccio. She's the superintendent over there. And we're working to see if we can strengthen this partnership and make sure that uh, our students have access to it. So I just wanted to update the committee that the MOU has been signed by Dr. Kerbo and Mayor Bettencourt, and that was sent over today. Uh, it is funded by a grant opportunity through the Smith Family Foundation. And that application is due on Friday. So that's why I wanted to update the committee on that. So I'll pause if any members have questions on that agenda item. No. Any, uh, any committee members would like to speak? Mrs. Carpenter? Oh, uh, also, we can go back to you, Dr. Vidala. Thank you. The, the final uh, agenda item on the superintendent's report is uh, about reopening and planning for the fall. So we have an opportunity for a potential partnership with Salem and Beverly. So the mayor of Salem, Mayor Driscoll, reached out to their superintendent and she contacted Dr. Perlow and I, as well as uh, Sue Korochek in Beverly, with an idea of hiring a consultant to help us with reopening that could do some research with us and they would develop an, uh, an RFP that would talk about transportation, talk about uh, whatever the protective equipment might need to be, and you know, joining in the three communities to share the cost and to uh, you know, have these similar communities of Phoebe, Salem, and Beverly. So one thing that I, I had mentioned uh, on the superintendent uh, thread, we were getting some information about next year's supplemental budget, which is at the state level at the end of the year, if there's any money left over in the FY20 budget, they create a pool of money called a supplemental budget where it can be earmarked for different things. So we will be applying for money to fund this through the, um, the supplemental budget. So it wouldn't be a cost to the district. Uh, we also have some other creative revenue streams that we're looking at if that doesn't go through. But I had talked to Mayor Bettencourt about it. He thought it was a good idea. I wanted to present that to the committee as something that we could potentially partner with and help to really gain a, a better understanding of how we're going to do the reopening and some of the challenges that we'll have, we might need some ongoing support. So I wanted to put that out there. If the committee had any questions, it's still in the infancy stages. Salem is looking to create the RFP, but we'd, we'd try to look to do this on something that wouldn't cost the district money, but would be a benefit to our staff and students and our community at large. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Vidal. Any questions, uh, Mrs. Dunn? Do you have any question or thought? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm very happy to hear about this. I think it's excellent, and I think anytime we can partner with the local schools around us on something that's going to benefit everyone, that it can be a very very positive um, project. 
As far as the funding, I'm glad that there, uh, there is a possibility of the supplemental budget. And I'm also aware that under the CARES Act, PBD will be, uh, is eligible for approximately $4.7 million in basically reimbursements for expenditures that have been generated by the responses to the, uh, to the virus. So I'm wondering if this may also be something that would uh, qualify for under, under that funding as well. So wherever you get the money, I think that's, I think that's great. And I, I appreciate what you're doing on that. Thank you. And I did have an item, but I'll, I'll wait until everyone else speaks. I just wanted to go back to something. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, Mr. I noticed, do you have a comment or question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It certainly does sound like an interesting idea. I think when you bring our neighboring communities together, that usually uh, turns successful to you know help us all move forward through this. I would like to learn more about um, the funding mechanism plan more than anything else. You know, I think um, the state budget is probably as in flux as our local budget is here with the revenues coming in. Um, so, you know, I, as you said, it is in the infancy state. So I look forward to learning more about this and um, seeing where those numbers match up um, as we go forward. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnotis. Uh, Mr. Hockman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This was another um, item that I asked to be put on the agenda in a different location. So I'm glad Dr. Vidal is bringing it up now. Uh, I'm less concerned with the funding as I am with the timing. Uh, you know, we're now in towards the end of May, Memorial Day is approaching, which is typically even in a non-COVID world, a shutdown weekend, four or five days typically. Um, and schools based on our 20, uh, the calendar we just approved is scheduled to begin August 31st, I think. Uh, so do you have any, any idea as to the timing of this? Um, information and or, or when it would begin and when we would get some solid data and, and then what we would do with that data once we received it? Absolutely. So we really feel like we're on the cutting edge of this. So we, we, we're talking about this in the reopening. Well, people are still talking about closing out the year. And I think this has really helped with Dr. Kerbal in the transition, being able to work together with Dr. Lord and, and having the three of us work together for, for planning purposes. So uh, Mayor Driscoll and Mayor Bettencourt have already spoken about this. Uh, a draft of an RFP has been developed by Salem Public Schools, and you know we've given some feedback on that. We'd be looking to move forward relatively quickly, and you know trying to get ahead of other districts so that we can get the best consultant possible. And then, as guidance changes, we'll have someone who will be tapped into that, and that will be their full-time responsibility of really doing the research for us, presenting us with the research, learning our specific communities and the local context and how it's different and why there's different needs in PV than in Salem. You know, so I think it's it's a really a, a large benefit for us. And to be starting now, I feel like we're ahead of the game because as the more information comes out, once we get somebody on board, it would likely be July 1st that they would be, you know, effective for the FY21 budget. Uh, but, you know, they would be doing their research now once they obtain the, the contract. Thank you for that, Dr. Vidal, and I agree with you. Um, the more information we get, the better off we are and the better off the public is. Some of the items I wanted to bring up and concerns I have is, uh, you know, the, the first thing I think we need to do is to, to get a pulse as to what parents and caregivers are comfortable doing with their children come September, regardless of what the, the results of, of or the, the even the scientific information that comes out between now and, and August or, or mid-August, parents are still going to be making decisions for their children that we're going to be required to honor. And we're going to need to figure out as a school district, you know, what do we do with that? So if we have, you know, approximately 6,000 students in Peabody and 800 of them decide through their parents that they don't want to return to school in September, for whatever reason, you know, are, are we going to be moving forward if the CDC and the governor and, and everyone else tells us, and you're, this study that you're looking for us to undertake, you know, says it's okay, and we're going to have 800 homeschool kids, and what does that look like? You know, and I'm just throwing, throwing rhetorical questions out there for you, Dr. Vidal. I'm not expecting answers. Are we looking at split school days? Are we looking at you know an afternoon session and a morning session to reduce class sizes? 
Are we looking at split school weeks where we have a week on for half the class and a week off, you know, the following week for that same half the class? Are we looking at outdoor classrooms? Are we looking at protective gear for students or protective gear for parents, uh, uh, staff members, excuse me? Um, are we looking, you know, these are just some of the initial questions as to how or, or if we can have uh, in-person learning, live learning uh, in classrooms come, come the fall. And all of that is gonna still revolve around parents' level of comfort with sending kids to school. So I wanted to, and I had it on the agenda later on, to see if the administration has started or is, if they haven't, is interested in starting some sort of um, uh, questionnaire you know, to, to get a pulse from, from people, you know, what, if this happens, in other words, if we enter phase three by July, whenever it's scheduled to, uh, the governor has it scheduled to us to enter it. If we do that, um, you know, are you prepared to send your child back to school August 31st? Are you prepared to send your child back to school August 31st? If we do these, provide these protective measures, um, I'm also worried about staff. You know, the, the virus seems to have taken a toll, a particularly hard toll on um, people who are over 65 or over 60 even. Um, you know, what are we going to do about a staff member who is uncomfortable coming back to work because of, um, to a live classroom setting because of their age and their susceptibility perhaps to contracting the virus uh, or their underlying health conditions? I mean, there's a whole host of questions that are out there and I'm glad I'm ecstatic to hear you talking about a partnership with, with other municipalities to start diving into this, but I'm hoping that the level or the depth of the conversation uh, exceeds even what I'm talking about. I think I'm hoping, I'm, I'm just probably tipping the surface of this. Um, so I just wanna bring those points up to you while you're starting this endeavor. Thank you, and, and many of those are included in the RFP. Many of those ideas that have been kicking around and there's, and there's more as well talking about acceleration academies, talking about transportation, talking about, you know, the impact on special education students. So there's a lot there to unpack and we don't have all the answers, but I think that's, that's why, you know, having someone who can assist us is, is definitely an advantage. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hockman. Uh, Mr. Amico. Thank you. Through the chair to, um, uh, Dr. Vidala. And uh, first, I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Hawkman. You were, you were right on on all those points. Um, you know, we don't know what, what will happen. Um, and, and this is one of the, the, the nice things about this uh, particular um, proposal here of, uh, of a consultant. Um, not, only, not only do teachers share um, and collaborate, you know, mayors do, you know, we often hear, you know, Mayor Betancourt saying that, you know, he talks to some of, uh, excuse me, he, he'll talk to Beverly, oh, he'll talk to Salem to see what they're doing on certain issues. And, and you know, this, this also includes our superintendents. You know, they should be sharing and collaborating, um, especially where we share the same geography. We're, you know, we're right next door to Beverly and Salem. So it, it really um, behooves us to, uh, to have a plan in place. And, and if we can share a consultant with all those, uh, you know, questions that, that, Ms., uh, that Mr. Hawkman had um, and beyond, then, then we should be doing it. Um, the thing is, is nobody knows what, what August 31st is going to be. So I, I think if we all uh, come together and use our resources and uh, whether it's our geographical resources or, or our, our government, um, we'll be better off and we'll, have, uh, we'll be better prepared to, uh, to open the school year, whether it's remotely, whether it's in class or whether it's a hybrid. So I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Badala. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mito. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Mr. Amico, uh, Dr. Vidal. Anything else you'd like to add? I believe that's it. Uh, unless Dr. Kerbel has anything, that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Kerbel. Anything you'd like to add? No, thank you. I'm good. I'm good. And uh, and pleasure to listen to Josh. Josh, they let you off easy, Josh. I thought they would ask you a few more questions. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty coming, but uh, Mr. Mr. Hockman really touched on, I think, a lot of the magic questions that we're going to be dealing with here. And I think the, the, the two of us just thought that working with Salem Beverly uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, share ideas, uh, share money. Um, you know, certainly that was a, a factor in this um, working together to maybe reduce costs as we do it uh, um, 
regionally made a lot of sense. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic and happy that we're moving forward with this. So uh, thank you, Dr. Vidala. Thank you, Dr. Kerbel. I will go on to the next item, written communications. Uh, we do have one communication from the city clerk regarding the state primary election. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Kerbel, I know you wanted to speak to this. I do, and and Mr. Amigo brought up the head. Uh, we did not have the 2021 calendar available, but um, I'm just looking at the communication from the city clerk is, is referencing the state primary election, which is September 1st, first day of school. And considering the COVID-19, we'd rather us have no school, a school be closed in that particular day. Uh, we have not done that in the past, from my recollection of what I've learned. Um, if that's the case, if the committee decides to close school on that day, um, then we would have to look at the 2021 calendar once again and make adjustments. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kerbal. I'll open that up to the committee. I, I see there's some comments here. Mrs. Dunn, would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do think that in light of the current um, concerns about the COVID virus and the fact that our schools are really vital to the election, I do think that perhaps we need to move the first day of school to the next day. Um, I do understand we usually have the day before or, or you know, time before school starts for our teachers to um, have professional development. And I'd just like to ask if we could look at that and have the calendar adjusted so that we can have the elections, they can go forward and then we would start school, keep them separate this year. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Mr. Amico. Thank you through the chair. Um, I agree with Ms. Dunn. I would also add, um, you know, because the election is on Tuesday the 1st, um, you know, elections typically, uh, the voting voting ends around eight o'clock at night, clean up. Um, it might be a pretty, uh, pretty big task to get those buildings ready for the next day. So um, what I would suggest is we, um, if we can put the calendar, uh, you know, depending on if we, we vote on it tonight, I think we have voted on the 2021 calendar already, and that, that was the issue, um, but also, possibly starting school on the third, because we would have to do a deep cleaning in those buildings um, if we have all those people coming into those buildings on that Tuesday. Think of it, uh, polls open at seven, they close at eight. You know, you could have, you could have a very large um, turnout and you have a lot of people in those buildings um, using the, the lobby area, possibly the restrooms. Um, you may have to do some deep cleaning. So. Um, I think we'd have to work with our maintenance group to see if they could uh, get schools ready for that that Wednesday, the second. Otherwise, I would suggest moving the start date to the uh, to the Thursday, the third. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miko. Mr. Hockman. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I I keep hearing throughout this meeting and meetings that we've had in the past few months that it's kind of premature to speculate as to what's going to happen in. August and September. I don't want to do anything yet. I, I appreciate the information first so that we can consider it. Um, and let's see where the state of the world is as as um, the primary date approaches. And I'm, I'm also trying to wrap my head around what primaries we're going to see in the city of Peabody. I mean, I understand, you know, Representative Spiliotis has decided to retire. So there'll be some activity in the West School and the Burke School, two polling places that were that are in that um, representative's district. Um, I haven't heard of a Democrat challenging Representative Walsh. I haven't heard of a Democrat challenging State Senator Lovely. And I haven't heard any Republican candidates announced for either of those seats either. So I'd like to kind of hold off on taking any action on this, seeing where things stand. First and second, if we're only talking about two schools, I'd be less inclined to disrupt the beginning of the school year. Another item that I hear about when I try to bring up other items um, for days off from school, like Rosh Hashanah, that we don't want to disrupt the beginning of the school year and the continuity that takes place early on in the school year. 
So um, if we can just, like I said, appreciate the information. Um, we have it now. Let's see how this develops and then take action on it if we need to at a later date. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. Uh, Mr. Amico. Mr. Mayor, if I could yield to uh, Mr. Arnotis, he he had he had his hand up first, and I could go after him. Oh, sorry, Mr. Arnotis, please, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Um, just very quick on this, I I actually think about I, I agree with Mr. Hockman on holding this for now. It's good information to have, but I think we actually have to remember that we may not know what voting actually looks like come the fall. There's a lot of conversations. Um, floating around out there about, uh, you know, any changes that could come, what what voting actually looks like, you know, there's proposals um, that, that have been in the media about, you know, early voting and, and mail-in and all sorts of different um, procedures that could come um, that may make voting a little bit more um, flexible or safer in, in any way. There, obviously, as you all know, there's been no um, decisions out there from whether it be the Secretary of State or changes that would be made um, legislatively. But I think right now, because we still have you know a couple months to go, it may be best to sit tight on the calendar um, right now and see what comes uh, going down the line. So I think you know we keep this information um, in the back of our minds and once everything gets more firm, um, perhaps we go from there. That's just my thought right now. Um, I obviously completely see the concern here. Um, you know, if, if everything stays exactly how it has been in the past, you know, I think this is a good conversation to come back to, and then we'd probably have to make that decision. But considering we really don't know what anything's going to look like in the fall, just education-wise, let alone voting-wise, I think it would be good to um, just hold off for right now. That's where I am. But you know, obviously, open to having this discussion. So let me know. Thank you, Mr. Arnotis. Uh, I'll go back to you, Mr. Amico. Thank you, through the chair um, to the committee. Um, yes, and the and the other, there is a um, uh, another primary as well, the uh, Senate um, Democratic Senate primary, Ed Markey and and Joe Kennedy. So um, that that would probably bring out a, a larger group. But um, I, I agree with Mr. Arnotis. We don't know um, what the future brings. Um, but, you know, we should be ready to um, to move on the calendar if something happens and uh, obviously bring the uh, the, the teachers uh, into it as well and, and the other uh, unions, because I do believe we do um, do agree to the uh, the contract um, uh, in negotiations. I, I, I believe we do. I'm not sure. If, no, actually, we don't. So uh, but I, I do think we need to bring them in as well on, on the conversation, um, you know, where it would be a change of a, a start time that everyone has agreed on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miko. Uh, go to Mrs. Dunn, then Mr. Olympio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think at this point, um, if we were able to assure the city clerk that voting will be able to take place in our building, any of the changes that would have to take place, of course, are going to be governed by what the actual situation, the health situation is on that day. Um, as far as you know, deep cleaning and access to the buildings. But I think as long as we can assure Ms. Danforth that we are going to allow voting to take place in the schools, that that may help alleviate some of the concern with the city clerk as far as administration of the election. And then you know, going forward, we can work out those details. We're gonna have to work with Mr. Hafey and of course with, with the clerk's office and then as Mr. Amico said, with the union. So there are a lot of moving parts to it, but at the moment, I think if we can assure the continued use of the building, that might go a long way to helping out with this with this question. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Mr. Olympio? Yeah, yeah through the chair. Uh, everyone uh, pretty much brought up some, some of the same points I was going to uh, talk about. So I would be in favor of, let's just take a wait and see uh, approach over the next coming weeks and see where we're at. There's no need to make any hasty decisions right now. Thank you. Okay, so is uh, everybody comfortable if we just hold this to uh, the next meeting, put that on the agenda and see how things unfold here in the weeks ahead? Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Arnotis, go ahead. Thank you, just quick. I actually, I, you know, on Ms. Gunn's point, uh, I actually think that would be a nice thing to do considering how much work the city clerk in that office does for the folks in the city if i would be happy to make a motion just to 
for us to send a letter to the clerk saying, you know, we're going to make our buildings available um, for voting, you know, pending on if we're all voting in person in the fall. But just as a little reassurance to folks over in the clerk's office, um, I, don't, I think that would be a harmless thing to do. And, you know, we'll adapt as we go. But I'm, I'm happy to make a motion to do that. And I'm happy to second it. All right. You've heard the motion by Mr. Our Notice uh, to send a communication over to the city clerk. Uh, seconded by Ms. Mrs. Dunn mm -hmm. on that motion. Any comments? Mr. Hockman, do you have a comment? Yeah, please. Um, I, I appreciate what Mr. Onotis and Ms. Dunn are saying, and I agree insofar as the, the clerk's office does a tremendous amount of work that um, goes unseen, and, and the Election Commission does a tremendous amount of work also. Um, I, I would, if you can tailor your motion to say that we will make the buildings available if we can. I don't know what August yeah. looks like. I mean, our, our primary focus is educating students to making sure they're safe and the staff is safe and 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 if voting impacts that in some manner um i don't want to assure the clerk's office that we can do something that will have a negative effect on students or staff so uh, I'm, I'm with you in spirit i just i just don't want to 99.9 percent .9 would be better for me than 100 percent if we can somehow fashion this motion Thank you, Mr. Hockman. Uh, Mr. Arnotis, did you want to weigh back sure, in? I, I'm absolutely fine with that. You know, we can say we're hoping to make our buildings available and, you know, have that continuity that we've, that we've always had. You know, um, obviously, we're going to keep our students and staff and teachers um, at the forefront of our minds. But I think just a little letter of assurance is not a, a bad thing. You know, pending everything is safe if we want to add something along those lines. But uh, I'm happy with that. That's not a problem. Nothing's 100%, as I think we all know. So that's not a problem for me. Great. Great. So uh, we have the motion by Mr. Arnotis, seconded by Mrs. Dunn. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Amico? Yes. Mr. Arnotis? Yes. Mrs. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Hockman? Yes. Mr. Olympia? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? Yes. And Mr. Chairman, I think the biggest concern is they don't want to have to try to find new precincts for the voting. I think that's the biggest worry. There are timelines they have to follow. Yes, no, that makes sense. Um, okay, so we'll do that. And we'll also uh, hold this for the uh, next agenda and make that uh, part of our agenda and see how things unfold over the weeks ahead. Yep. Good. All right, so we'll go to uh, subcommittee reports. Uh, education subcommittee, uh, Mr. Hockman, anything to report? No report. Finance, Mrs. Carpenter? Nothing to report. A school safety, Mr. Olympio? Uh, nothing new to report. Athletics and wellness, Mr. Hockman? Nothing to report. Quality and standards, Mrs. Dunn? The quality and standards subcommittee is going to begin meeting next week on several issues of policy to um, review them and to prepare new policy to bring forward to the school committee. Okay, thank you. Parent and student advisory boards, Mrs. Dunn? Nothing at this time. Building and grounds, Mr. Amico? Nothing at this time. Special education, parent advisory board, Mr. Olympio? Uh, nothing new to report. City council and legislative delegation, Mr. Arnotis? Nothing new to report. Okay, uh, we'll go now to new business. We have a number of items. Uh, we've already touched on some of them, but we have a number of items here. The first one is one that I brought forward uh, regarding school choice vote. Um, as in the past, we have, a, as a committee, have to vote whether to offer school choice. And I uh, just wanna make sure that we differentiate. School choice is when we allow students from outside the district, other cities and towns to come to Peabody. Open enrollment uh, is when we allow students that uh, maybe live in one part of the city to go to a school in a different part of the city, um, west going to south and things of that nature. But school choice is something we have to take up now. Um, according to DESE, uh, we have to make a vote by June 1st. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, ha we have to vote uh, before June 1st. Right now, we have it accepted school choice in the past. And if we don't make a vote, a vote, that'll just continue to be our city position. I've spoken in the past 
that I am not in favor of school choice. Uh, some years ago I was, and uh, now uh, I do not think this is the direction we wanna go. Um, and uh, the only exception being, as we've spoken in the past, the exception being students that are already part of our system that we brought in from other cities and towns, uh, their younger brothers and sisters, I think uh, should have that uh, opportunity to come here if they so choose. Uh, that'd be at the discretion of the superintendent and also uh, some of our educators and administrators, uh, people who work for the city and the school department, that they'd have the ability to bring their student, their children to be students here in Peabody. Um, I think that's a service we should offer as well to our educators and, and administrative and support staff. Uh, again, that'd be at the discretion of the superintendent. So uh, I'm not in favor of, of making that a full policy and open policy. Uh, just for those specific examples, we would give the superintendent that ability. Uh, but I wanted to put this on to gauge interest and, and speak to this um, this topic and get everybody's input. Uh, but that's that's my feeling uh, as to how uh, we should proceed. And I wanted to open it up for discussion. Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. Um, this comes up every year. We discuss it every year. And I am in agreement, you know, that I do not want to have um, school choice any longer, except for those children that are grandfathered in. But as is my concern every year, and I state the same message every year, if we do not vote to allow school choice, you cannot allow any exceptions, meaning we cannot accept any new staff children um, or anything like that. That has always been my concern, and which is why I vote yes, so that the superintendent can have discretion to allow um, what I believe would be okay as staff children to come. Um, so that's my only concern and the reason why I would vote yes for school choice. Thank you, Mrs. Carpenter. And, and just to add to that, uh, some years ago, we as a committee decided to allow for school choice. And at the time, uh, our numbers were, um, there was a significant gap in between our numbers in that we were, a number of people were leaving Peabody to go to other districts. Um, and then when that happens, the money that would come to the school district for that student, that goes to the district that they're going. So if somebody from PVD chose to go to Beverly, the money that would come for the, that student's education would go directly to Beverly. So for a number of years, we were paying a lot more money or losing a lot of money that were going to other districts. When we opened up school choice, we thought that we could generate some um, money coming back here from the city of Peabody, from other cities and towns that uh, students would come here. And now, I think because of our middle school and because of, I think, the good work we've been doing, we have uh, significantly more people coming into the district than leaving. Uh, so we're uh, bringing in income um, much more than what's sending out. But the issue is that um, it's having an impact on our district, our resources, our buildings, uh, things of that nature. It's really putting stress and I think, um, some undue tension on all of our educators and our system as a whole. So that's that's a big part of the reason why I don't support this. And it has come up in the past where if we shut it down completely, then that would prevent those other uh, exceptions that I know we're, we're interested in. Um, so let's continue the discussion. I know Mr. Miko wants to speak on it and Mrs. Dunn. Mr. Miko, I'll go to you. Great, thank you through the chair uh, to the committee. And I agree with Ms. Carpenter, this does come up. Um, every year and we, uh, I think we vote on a, a yes because we want to um, allow the uh, staff members to continually bring their students in and to have younger siblings of those students who are here already. Um, I believe last year we did give the superintendent some, uh, some leeway um, in regards to making decisions because of some of our buildings that are uh, close to capacity. Um, so I, what I would do is I would, I would continue to, to vote yes on this and, um, and allow the, uh, the superintendent at, its, at his discretion to um, allow students in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miko. Mrs. Dunn? I'll be honest, I'm gonna say pretty much the same thing as Mrs. Carpenter and Mr. Miko. Um, I, I do think that with the parameter of the discretion of the superintendent, that this program can work for us. So uh, welcome to Peabody, Dr. Vidala. <laughs> right. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Olympio? 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with Ms. Cobbett, Ms. Uh, Ms. Dunn, and Ms. Fermico. I'll be voting yes because I feel like uh, in the past the superintendents have done a, a good job of uh, really they understand you know what our wishes are. So I'll be in, you're voting in favor of this because I, I do feel I'm afraid that if we vote no, then that will handcuff us for some of those exceptions that we want. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olympio. Could I have a, can we have a motion then to uh, approve school choice with those specific um, recommendations to the superintendent? So moved. Okay. okay, you've heard the motion by Mrs. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Olympio. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Amico? Yes. Mr. Anotis? Yes. Mrs. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Olympio? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? Yes. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Want to go back to new business, a number of items that have been brought forward. Uh, by Mr. Hockman and members. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Mr. Hockman. The first one is ceremonies and recognitions. Um, I'll turn it over to you and we can start uh, going through these important items. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and again, um, I'm expecting that these conversations are already started and taking place. Um, we just want to filter information out to people if that's the case. If not, um, maybe get a better understanding as to what we can do. We have several um, milestone ceremonies that take place this time of year, uh, including academic awards and convocation, graduation. We had a special meeting on last Monday, um, George PBD Medal Awards, uh, Science Fair Awards, moving on ceremonies from the Higgins, moving on ceremonies from the elementary schools, National Honor Society inductions, National Junior Honor Society inductions. So uh, I'm kind of touching, I think quite a few of them, but I'm sure I'm leaving some out and that's unintentional, but uh, I don't know through the mayor to whom uh, maybe Dr. Kerbel would start with you or Dr. Lord on some of the high school stuff. Thank you. I can run some of the high school activities that are going on. Um, the one that's on most people's radar right now is a, a graduation parade that we'll be doing with the senior class on Friday. Uh, we're anticipating the students to come in between 9.30 and 10 o'clock in waves by alphabet. We're hoping the faculty will be in the parking lot every other space. Um, and there was a rather elaborate parade route through the student parking lot. We think it should be a lot of fun. There's a couple of surprises for the seniors. I hope they show up for this event. It'll be a nice uh, celebration for them. The uh, scholarship team is um, a little bit behind as usual, um, but hopefully they'll be able to get all the scholarships organized uh, within the next week or two and um, probably mid-June or as early as we possibly can, we'll have a convocation or scholarship night. Um, those are the major events and or we're recognizing National Honor Society students during that convocation and ownership honors night. Are there any other ones at the high school that uh, are of concern, Mr. Hawkins? Um, academic awards. That's going to be part of the uh, convocation night, I believe. I, I can check with our team. I know that that's coming together. There's conversations about that, yeah. So through, through the mayor to Dr. Lord, thank you for that information. Are you envisioning a virtual type event for those evenings? Is that what you're talking about? Again, it depends on where we are with respect to social gatherings, or hopefully we could do it in small groups. Uh, I believe the scholarships involved, but around 125 of our senior class, uh, maybe in small groups or we do have, um, if we do follow the parade route, we do have an opportunity, for example, um, on the parade route on on uh, Friday, seniors will get a chance to drop a envelope with their senior pictures and the teacher's name on it in a bin right at the um, turnaround entrance to the front of the school there. And uh, if we can do a event like that for scholarships or we can have families come through and, and pick up scholarships and recognize students one at a time, uh, that plan is still coming together, but again, it depends on the physical distancing requirements that we have to meet. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, it's a little bit up in the air, but at least the process is moving forward for establishing scholarship award winners and uh, preparing checks and the appropriate certificates and so forth for that special night. Yeah. And, and typically, historically, I think for convocation, the student just gets a notice um, to, to, uh, to attend convocation without knowing what scholarship they or how, which scholarships they won. That's correct. You know, maybe perhaps we can utilize school resource officers to 
continue that by dropping notes off at the houses of the students who were um, who are going to going to be recipients of scholarships, just to kind of keep that um, aspect of it moving forward alive and and you know the excitement build up the excitement perhaps and absolutely couldn't agree more yeah we'll get there thank everybody there for their patience it's a little bit challenging doing all this remotely no oh, I, I certainly understand that I, I absolutely understand that I'm just trying to like I said understand where things stand and, and you know folks out there are as well yeah I can add to that for the middle school um the middle school they're making plans they met they're, they're trying to they're also waiting a little bit but they're looking at drive-through certificates. It all depends on if they're able to meet or not, but teachers would hand out certificates to students. They're looking at some you know, recording, some type of ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, they're working on the logistics, the uh, National Junior Honor Society. Uh, I think both schools, and forgive me, Chris, if you, if you mentioned this, um, but those that are in the National Honor Society are going to be into the National Honor Society have been notified. Um, I'm trying to think. And so oh, in the, the elementary school have moving on ceremonies, fifth grade of the middle school. They're just waiting to see what happens at the middle school. So they're trying to coordinate efforts you know, as a group, see what happens at the middle school first um, in terms of moving on ceremonies. Uh, and that's it so far. I think that it's the 19th of um, May, Look, probably there'll be an agenda item tomorrow for us and Friday with the principals, see where people are at. But thank you for bringing it up. Thank you, I'd open it up to other committee members, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, you, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Hockman. Um, Mr. Dunn, I know you raised your hand. Thoughts on this? <laughs> thank you. Uh, just just a couple. Um, one is one one item that was just brought up was about having um, notices of the convocation delivered to the homes. Those invitations have always been mailed to the people, so there's never there's never been a problem with that invitation in the past. So I would say that you could still continue with the mail. That that's routine. Um, the other one that came up was about the presentation of the George Peabody medals, and normally. We, they are, they are pinned to the graduates at the graduation ceremony, but the actual George Peabody ceremony, uh, George Peabody medal ceremony is conducted by the library trustees. So I think we have to find out what their plans are, as that is, that is within their realm and see how they would like to coordinate this. Um, that's a very small event it actually may be something that they would be able to hold. And um, honestly, at this moment, I don't think we know that. We'd have to check in with the uh, trustees to find out what that would entail. Um, the other item was with any of these outside of graduation, is the goal to have all of these other ceremonies take place in the month of June, more or less traditionally with the school year? Yes, that's true. That's correct. We're trying to have the high school ones happen in June, sometime in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, if I can just speak quickly on the George Peabody Medal Awards. Please. Yeah, I, I did speak with uh, Stephanie Najjar, a library trustee. Um, I believe that the trustees are interested in um, doing something. And, and she even indicated that, and this was before yesterday's, you know, phase one opening of the of the state. But she was even willing to deliver um, medals to the recipients if necessary. She was uh, eager to have some sort of recognition or ceremony, as I think the the ceremony has gone has has gone on continuously for I think it's about 160 years or so, or, or 155 <laughs> years. 
So she yes. didn't want this to interrupt it. Um, so, but I agree with you that Dr. Lord, perhaps you um, speak out, speak to Stephanie or, or some other library trustees. Yeah. yeah, I know there's been some communication about the George <laughs> DVD medals and their distribution. Um, and I can have more information for you at our next meeting, but I, I know that there's dialogue about it and it's on people's radar. It's one of the agenda items for the um, convocation team. Mm -hmm. Very good. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Amico, did you have a comment? Yes, thank you. And through the chair to um, Dr. Kerbel and Dr. Laura, thank you for, um, for putting together these uh, high school events. Um, I received a couple of emails last week from a, a couple of seniors who, uh, who maybe promised them that we'd have a convocation. I said, I couldn't promise, but I'm definitely gonna try my best. Um, but with that said, um, I, I do think um, if you could, before any information gets um, sent out to students and parents at the school committee uh, be notified, um, just, just so we, we have dates, events, and, and, and we may even want to add some touch to the particular ceremony. So if you could do that uh, with convocation and those events, and obviously for the uh, George Peabody Awards to, uh, to re as, as uh, Ms. Ms. Dunn and Mr. Hawkins said, reach out to um, our library trustees uh, because they do an incredible job with that event. And it's probably, you know, other than convocation, graduation, one of the top events for these for these seniors. It's, it truly is amazing. But if we could be kept in the loop before any information is sent out to the public, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Amico, nice haircut. Looking good. Looking good. <laughs> Mr. Um, Mayor, one last uh, that was that was not from my original my um my normal barber, original barber. That was from um I'll say it, my wife. She did a good job. <laughs> yeah, my wife's been cutting I'm, I'm my on hair. tape, I have to say that. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um my wife's been cutting my hair as well. Um Mr. Hockman, I'm sorry, go ahead. You still have yeah. the floor. One last point before that. I want to give another ba baseball reference to Joe Amico's haircut. Looks like Sal, Sal the Barber Magley, <laughs> one of you old timers that remember him. But in any event, I, I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to recognize uh, Mr. Onotis, who has undertaken a, a really, uh, on behalf of I think the school committee, a project that uh, Ms. Scarys put out there. And if maybe Mr. Onotis can speak about that, um, it, it's really nice of you to take this on, and it's meaningful to our students. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. Um, I know some of our staff at the high school have been working on a project for our seniors. I actually, I don't want to go too far into it. I'm not sure what's, um, oh, yes. Okay. I just want to say we're, we're happy as a school committee to participate in um, this special project that is going on. That is all I'm going to say, but I, I do want to give a shout out um, to Miss Scary and some of the other staff up at the high school. And I'm sure we'll have more praise for them um, once everything is out there, but it's a very nice project. And um, I know uh, as our small portion of it, as the board, you know, we're happy to contribute and, and just hope our seniors have, you know, the best experience they can while dealing with all this. So we wish them the best. And I'm so grateful um, for our staff at the high school. You know, I think that's also another piece that people should realize, and it almost actually goes back to what you know Mrs. Hemring was talking about earlier, that they're working constantly, but there are also so many small things that are going on behind the scenes that most people have no idea that are taking place that folks are going above and beyond outside of their job lap of obligations, just as good natured people to um, make this uh, tolerable and enjoyable for our students. So thank you, thank you to them. And um, I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk about that more at another point. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Mr. Arnotis. And that was very, very skilled how you carefully worded uh, your response. That was well done. Um, okay, so we have a couple Dr. other Lord items. Dr. Lord has his hand up. Sorry, Dr. Lord. Oh, Dr. Lord. Dr. Lord, go ahead. Um, yeah, just a couple of things for people to be aware of. Um, Again, this Friday is the uh, last official day for seniors to have online classes, and I'm giving all of them a pass to be out of class so they can participate in the parade for about a half an hour on Friday morning, which will be fun. Um, next Monday is the day the teachers will be posting grades for the students, and we hope to be able to post the seniors' fourth quarter report cards in the middle of next week uh, onto the Aspen portal. And I've already recommended this to the seniors. It'll be a very unusual report card telling them the status of their performance and degrees of proficiency with which they've met the vision of the graduate expectations. It's a very unusual communication that the seniors can take with them to get jobs or to their colleges. 
uh, and really highlight some of the good skills that they have, not only their good grades, but in addition, those seven skills that are being illustrated every report card in the, um, in the vision of the graduate. So that'll be next week as well. We'll also be collecting all the textbooks from the uh, seniors, or they'll be going through the um, parade route to collect all their textbooks. And on the week of June 1st, we'll be um, getting the uh, Chromebooks from the senior class, as well as handing out their caps and gowns and their yearbooks. So seniors, this Friday's process of learning how to do the parade is gonna illustrate all of these events for you. So we're looking forward to having a, a wonderful couple of weeks for our senior class. And those are some of the highlights, but I'll get the details out to all the school committee prior to going um, more public with any, any more of that information. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lord. Okay, so we have um, under new business, we had summer school 2020 and 2020, 20, 2021 school year outlook. I know we've touched on those quite a bit uh, earlier in the meeting. Mr. Hockman, anything you wanted to add further on those? No, I'm good on both those items. Thank you. All right, so now we can go to summer food service. Uh, Mr. Hockman, I'll turn it to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know that we have a meeting uh, tomorrow, I think, talking about this. I just wanted to um, put it on. I actually asked for it to be put on the agenda before I was aware of that meeting. So I suspect we're going to talk about that uh, in depth tomorrow, and we can maybe put this on the next agenda. Yep, that's a good idea. We have a meeting tomorrow with uh, your program, No Child Goes Hungry in Peabody, Citizens in our library, some other community services that we provide, and we're going to talk about the summer plan. So yeah, let's keep this on, and we can give an update at the next meeting. Okay, uh, next item, FKO grant, uh, the support for the NCGH. Mr. Hockman? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This seems a little bit different. Um, the uh, administration over at For Kids Only reached out to me about a month ago to see what, if anything, they can do to support um, No Child Goes Hungry in Peabody. And uh, what we talked about was a lack of um, fresh fruit and dairy that we were able to provide to um, recipients of No Child Goes Hungry backpacks or bags um, just due to some logistical issues, just due to some, some financial issues and other things. Uh, what Four Kids Only did was they actually applied for a grant um, that they received, that they that they were awarded, that allows for them to provide uh, seven pieces of fresh fruit and seven snacks. They couldn't do dairy because of refrigeration limitations, uh, but seven pieces of fresh fruit and seven snacks um, for not only just the, the No Child Goes Hungry and Peabody recipients, but for every student that shows up at the Grab and Goes on Mondays, and that's open to all students in our district who are on free or reduced lunch. So for the past two Mondays, um, every student that's shown up for a grab and go, in addition to receiving the food pre prepared and provided by food services uh, and the groceries that uh, No Child Goes Hungry has been providing in partnership with Citizens in Haven from Hunger, the student has also been receiving a bag containing seven pieces of fresh fruit and seven snacks. Uh, and that grant, from what I understand, is going to continue through uh, the summer, th this summer. Uh, so I just wanted to make everybody aware of that and also to thank uh, Four Kids Only for being thoughtful and reaching out to us to see what they can do to help and in fact helping um, provide our students with, um, you know, fresh fruit, which is extremely important. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. I know the um, Brooksby Farm, that operation is going to be getting underway and I know that we've, uh, we've been a big part of that as well. So we're hoping to do that again also this year. Yeah, no, absolutely. Brooksby Farm has been a great community partner. Um, you know, when I first uh, asked you uh, when No Child Goes Hungry came into being, I first I initially asked you if we can receive some fresh fruit from the Brooksby Farm to give to these kids. You, you didn't even hesitate. You didn't blink. You said, of course you can. And uh, I thank you for that. And the, the staff and, and the People up at Brooksby have been um, super, super cooperative and super helpful in every facet of that. So that, that's been a big part of our program and we appreciate it. Great, thank you, Mr. Hockman. So uh, a couple more items here, uh, major construction projects, Mr. Hockman. Yeah, I just wanted to talk quickly on that um, or maybe not so quickly. I know the city council is undertaking some special permit hearings and some other things. I hear maybe the conservation commission is opening, opening up again. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed with 
to, or I am concerned slightly with major construction. I'm more concerned with major demolition. Um, as we're in this environment where our homes are our classrooms, our teachers are working from their houses to provide instruction to students, and our students are home with expected to perform work now, um, at least through the end of the, the school year, I just want to remind maybe or, or to make the, the city council and other committees and commissions aware that um, you know any significant noise or, or distraction, uh, particularly to our special education population uh, that may have some sensitivities to noise or to other pollutants that, that take place, um, just to be uh, aware that you know uh, every house in Peabody is now a classroom. Um, Historically, if there's a, a major building project taking place in, you know, in close proximity to a school, we, we receive the courtesy of, of speaking on that project. Um, every house, every apartment, every mobile home is now a classroom. So uh, I just wanted to kind of bring it out here and, and um, hopefully uh, everyone's sensitive to that, uh, not just the council, but developers as well and, and people who are considering some major projects, uh, you know, the, certainly the um, building commissioner's office and, and things along those lines. No, oh, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Thank you. Uh, access to school buildings. Um, I know that's a item Dr. Kerbel, Dr. Lord have been working on quite a bit. Mr. Hockman, did you want to speak to that before I go to Dr. Kerbel? Uh, just briefly, I, I mean, part of my concern, um, it, part of my concerns were twofold. One was um, it was when FKO came to talk to me about, um, or to, came to No Child Goes Hungry to talk about what they can do to support uh, our program. They also indicated that they had some food and snacks that were in buildings that they were hoping to access to recover and donate to us for distribution before they went beyond their expiration date. Um, I did hear that, I think they got into at least one building. I'm not sure if maybe Dr. Kerbel can talk about that more. But that was one area of concern. Another was um, with the equity piece that we've been talking about in Ms. Chioda's department and being able to access records. Uh, and I, from what I hear, that may have been resolved uh, as well. So um, whatever Dr. Kerbel or Dr. Lord can add to that is appreciated. I may have been what I can add to it. I, I yes, need, please. I don't know what happened to my video. I, I must have zoomed out permanently. So. Um, yeah, you do have a face for radio. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had the voice for it. <laughs> um, so let me touch base with the FKO. And um, uh, we worked with the mayor and, and Jim Hafey to allow special ed staff to get into the West School. So that was appreciative. And let me follow up with FKO. And um, I know that the elementary the principals have already have plans to, to you know, get belongings, get in the air. Okay, so we're close to, we're close, but let me follow up, Jared, with um, FKO. Appreciate it, Mark. Right. Thank you. All right, last item, staff highlights, Mr. Hockman. We have a wonderful administrative assistant named Marge Maccarelli, who knows how to put agenda items in the right order. <laughs> this, is, this is this is the perfect place to end our meeting. And Miss Henry highlighted several things that our staff is doing. I just want I, you know these meetings are difficult. Um, they're difficult to to um, run. And Mr. Mayor doing a fantastic job. They're difficult to participate in because um, I think we all wish that we were actually near each other and and seeing each other. They're difficult for the for the uh, audience to. Um, listen to because it's just a different format. Um, so, I, you know, maybe we can, as, as long as we're uh, ha having these meetings by Zoom, maybe we can end with staff highlights uh, each meeting um, and just talk about, so maybe even when we get back to live meetings too, Mr. Mayor, let's end on positive notes and talk, accentuate the great things that our staff and students are doing. You know, Dr. Kerbel mentioned the lemonade stand I, that occurred yesterday. I happened to drive past it coincidentally. It was fantastic to see, you know, the community supporting a young young student who, um, you know, had the foresight to, to think of others 
and think of others' needs and how she can help them. Uh, this this today this morning in my mail, I received a um, package from my fifth grade daughter's teacher at the center school with you know a nice note and and a, a little bit of candy, you know, just kind of saying uh, that you know she misses them and hopes to see them soon. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of those things going on. The parades that are taking place by the elementary schools are, are wonderful and uplifting. Um, so I just wanted to um, point out some good stuff, a lot of good stuff that's going on and acknowledge it and recognize it and thank those that are participating in it. Thank the teachers and the staff members for continuing to be supportive of our students and families, uh, administrators as well. I know the special education department is working tirelessly um, to, to to reach out to students who um, have some particular difficulties and families who have challenges um, in providing them support. So uh, I just wanted to thank everyone who's doing all that and recognize it. Great, thank you, Mr. Hockman. Um, Mrs. Dunn, uh, you wanna comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. I think this is wonderful. And I think that this is something we should always be doing. One thing I will let the committee know, as you know, I was invited to join the high school climate meeting, uh, climate committee this past year. And I've thoroughly enjoyed going to those meetings and hearing of the work they're doing. And one of the things that has been a longstanding issue for me has been how many things go on in our district that never, never receive publicity. They're not in the newspaper. There are so many things that happen that are good and trying to get that good news out is really difficult. One of the other things that I had brought to that climate committee was how proud we should be of our staff and how I think it's important that the staff is recognized for their accomplishments. We have many staff members who go on for advanced degrees and as a school committee, we don't learn of that. And I think it would be important for the students to know a bit about their teachers or staff members, about the people that they see every day. And um, they could really see a different side of that person. So similar to this, but on a bit of a different track, I can tell you that the high school is working on this project and hopefully it's going to come to fruition in September. And you'll be learning a lot of really important pieces of the lives of our staff members and be even more proud of them. So I don't think we can ever thank people enough and I don't think we can ever recognize them enough for going above and beyond. And uh, it's an important thing. So glad, right. glad you brought this up. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hockman. I think that's a terrific idea. Uh, a lot of these items will keep on for the next agenda. Our next regular meeting is June 2nd. I think Dr. Lord is, has his hand up. Yep. Uh, yep, Dr. Lord, please go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Unfortunately, I don't have the ability to raise my hand as a host. Uh, all of you guys <laughs> have that privilege. <laughs> yep, all right. So anyway, I wanted to echo um, Mrs. Dunn's comments. Uh, the staff at the high school is absolutely top shelf. Uh, I have never worked in a high school that had 21 advanced placement programs. It's the biggest AP program set on the North Shore. And it's really just an, an extraordinary building. And it's really really set to go places. It's about to take off. Mr. Magnos could be in, in good hands with some really good people. Um, I did want to stand corrected on a comment I made earlier. It's finals week next week for the uh, seniors. So we will be collecting their books next week. And it's the week after that, that we'll be distributing their report cards. So they have to wait a couple weeks for their report cards. They won't be next week. So I want to thank all the emails that just avalanched onto my phone <laughs> to correct that. At least some people are watching. We know. Thank you. That was all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lord. So uh, we'll keep a number of these items on for our meeting June 2nd. Uh, we will be adjusting the time. We'll work that out and make sure that's well known to everybody. Um, and uh, good. Thank you. We covered a lot of ground today. Excellent meeting. And I wish everybody uh, safety, health, and, uh, and let's just keep working towards the better days ahead. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.